There we are, we're live now. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mick. Hi, Mick. We're just going to let the audience in. That's happening now, and then we'll make a start. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, people are um, coming, coming in, in. <laughs> entering, joining us. Let's give it a couple of minutes because it's, it's, people are flooding in by the looks of it. Well, I've just done one Beck CLP, so. Excellent. Okay, just give it one more minute and then the numbers seem to be going up quite rapidly. There's a problem with, with Yulia, uh, Elena. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, shall we? Let's make a start, shall we? Can I welcome everybody? Um, the excellent. Uh, Hi, everyone. Welcome you. There. Okay, Hi. let let's make a start now. Everyone, uh, everyone's arrived, and we've got lots of people, participants still joining the meeting. But let's make a start because there's a large number of speakers, and there's a lot to get through. Let me just introduce myself. My name is John MacDonald. I'm a member of Parliament. I'm a member of Parliament for Hayes and Harlington in West London. I'm, I'm joining the meeting from Parliament and there are a, a range of uh, individual pieces of legislation going through Parliament this evening and there'll be a number of votes. So occasionally you'll hear bells ringing and it's the bells ringing to summon me to vote and I'll have to leave the meeting and Chris Ford will take over chair, chairing the meeting. But let me just welcome everybody. I'm so pleased that people have been able to make it. Um, basically, we have a number of speakers from Ukraine, and they'll be talking from different regions of the Ukraine, and all have been affected by the invasion itself. Um, they're all engaged in a wide range of activities, both in terms of the military activity and passive resistance to the invasion, and also in supporting one another in the community and mutual aid and assistance to the people overall. Um, speakers will speak for about five to seven minutes each. And um, then once our Ukrainian comrades have spoken, there'll be a series of speakers who are involved in the recent delegation to Ukraine. Um, they'll be reporting back on some of the issues that they found and followed through since they came back. Let me introduce our first speaker then. Our first speaker is Ivana Krapko. She's part of the State Employees Union of Ukraine, and she's chairperson of the Youth Council of the Federation of Trade Unions of Ukraine. Um, Ivana, it's really, really good to see you. Over to you. Mm, yes, uh, so, hey, everyone. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing that now I can participate in this meeting. And uh, the first I want uh, to say like, thanks God. And before uh, start this war, I met with Julie and Julia in Kyiv. And we had uh, our trade union meeting and I participated in this meeting and uh, I met with uh, them. So, um, you know, it's like a powerful of our trade union that uh, now, uh, now we can talk with you. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, about me, you said that uh, uh, I work with the youth network of our, our uh, trade um, uh, of our um, the trade U uh, union uh, of Ukraine. Uh, yes, now um, now I'm in Chernivtsi. It's uh, the um, the small small city in the west of Ukraine. Uh, I moved on from uh, Kiev to Chernivtsi when it was like the first day of this awful war uh, because I try to protect my uh, friend with uh, her uh, little child, Angela. It's like one year uh, old uh, girl. 
so um, when this war uh, started, uh, my friend Oksana, she lived near um, Juliana airport. And uh, if you know, uh, in the first day of this war, they uh, started to bombing uh, also this airport. So um, I um, went to uh, my friend and tried to protect her. Uh, we spent like uh, two nights uh, in shelter, uh, in shelter with, uh, and uh, you have to know that when you have very little child, it's, um, it's so difficult to be in shelter. And uh, uh, so uh, also thanks God, we have opportunity with another, my friend, uh, to move on from, from Kyiv to, to Chernivtsi in the safe place. And, uh, uh, you know, um, I haven't imagined that uh, once of my life, I can drive in from Kyiv to Chernivtsi and uh, some airplane above of my head can explosion. It, it's, um, it's so, so strange um, in, in, in this time. Uh, but uh, uh, okay, now uh, I'm in the safe place and um, uh, I, um, I don't want to leave my country. I, now I have to be here. And uh, now uh, I'm like a leader of our uh, trade union news network. I have to do all of I can uh, because I have responsible uh, before my, uh, my, my members, before my friends uh, who now uh, involved for, uh, engage, for example, to local military defense, to our army, who are now in very difficult, very difficult military cities. Uh, so I, I'm stay here and I do my work. And um, what we try to do now, uh, our uh, use network, um, uh, it's also the same like our trade union. We have very big network uh, um, around all, all of our country. So we have a lot of contact and, um, uh, and this, uh, this kind of network uh, help us to protect our members. And what, what we can do now? Now we do a lot of, um, a lot of volunteers process. We try to find some, some dif different kind of, uh, of aids in, in Ukraine. And also we work with uh, some of our um, partners uh, in trade union work, like from, uh, for example, from Sweden, because my trade union, we work uh, directly with uh, some Swedish trade union. So we, we have great communication with Sweden with Germany, for example. Now I have very great uh, connection also with, um, with you. Uh, so we, we try to use all our channels uh, which we have for sharing information about, about this war in Ukraine. Uh, because uh, also you know this, uh, this um, strong Putin propaganda, uh, uh, this pro pro propaganda sharing not only in Russian, this sharing also in, in Europe. So if we are uh, now here, we can share in the truth. So with our use network work, we try share this true information. And uh, for example, we make it like a video statement from our use network from different, different cities. Even, even we include <clears throat> one of our members from Kherson, which are now totally occupied. And also one, uh, my colleague from um, Kharkiv, which are now totally bombing. They bomb in Kharkiv every day, every night. But uh, my strong uh, trade union sister, Alla, she tried to do this, this statement and uh, told all the world what, um, what feeling uh, she, had, she has in, in this moment. So we made the statement and, uh, uh, and our colleague from, for example, from union to union, from Swedish trade union, they sharing, they sharing this video statement of, for different ways and also with our with my trade union colleagues we created like a facebook chat and this facebook chat name it like um, help ukraine and we it's uh, funny but uh, we decided to create this chat when uh, we was with, with my colleague oksana in shelter we was in shelter and we start thinking what what we can do in this moment so uh, we decided, okay, we have a lot of, we, we have some international cooperation, so we, we can create this chat. And in the shelter, 
we create this chat help of Ukraine and engage um, uh, uh, a lot of person which we know maybe directly or some of our um, some of our colleagues. And uh, now this chat is like the place where we also sharing uh, information which help we need, for example, yes, or some information about them. Um, about war, about 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 our, our activities which we have in Ukraine now. Uh, maybe during uh, last week and also today, uh, we had a meeting with, um, for example, our head of regional organization. Because in Ukraine we have a little bit specific um, you know, organization structure. Uh, so we we had like central committee, and we have also head of our regional organization in all of all of region in Ukraine. So we try to, uh, we don't try, we connect, we connect with, uh, with them. Uh, when this war starts, we, we connect like uh, using the phone, we have a lot of phone calls, but today, thanks God, we can uh, have this um, you know, Zoom meeting and we talk with them. And also we uh, start to uh, collect um, uh, uh, information about uh, uh, different kind of aid which uh, they, they need, because we have to know how we can help. So we, we had today this meeting and, uh, you know, um, okay, we, we collected this information, but um, in the person, it's a very great way to talk with people, because also you have to know that now a lot of our people have a very high level of stress, very high level, and it's so difficult for, for psychology. Uh, also, I wanted to say that um, now uh, it's my point, my point of view, but now Ukrainian society, it's a very strong society because also I haven't imagined that all Ukrainian um, people have, uh, have united, yeah? And uh, have uh, and can to do this, um, this work uh, so, so strong and uh, so efficient. And uh, uh, even if you um, if you read some information or if you follow in some um, I don't know some pages in Facebook, you also um, can see how what do our people in for example in Mariupol. You have to, you know that Mariupol it's the city which now blocked during maybe twelve or, or thirteen days, totally totally blocked. But people in Mariupol. They uh, say that we don't want to be under Russian control. They have very strong Ukrainian position and it's, it's wonderful. And also in Melitopol, for me, uh, it was, uh, for me like young uh, person, it was very strange when in this time, uh, <laughs> Russian government, uh, they are uh, following their um, major to Melitopol, it's woman, and uh, uh, he starts to talk with um, civilian in Mariupol. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's amazing because I can understand it, how, how Russian government can do it. And in Melitopol, all of people also say, say that we don't want to, to be in the Russian control. They, uh, they have a lot of demonstration. For example, also in uh, Kherson. In Kherson, people have, um, uh, every day this demonstration and say that Kherson it's Ukraine it's don't Russian uh, city uh, and uh, it uh, it means that Ukrainian society now it's um, do very strong uh, they have very strong gathering position Ukrainian position uh, what uh, uh, also do our trade union uh, yes uh, in Ukraine um, we have uh, like different trade union but uh, now we start uh, to, we try to join our efforts and which, uh, for example, Kyiv Regional Trade Union Organization and also NGO uh, Labor Initiative, we uh, created like initiative and it names like um, Trade Union Lifeline. Lifeline. Yeah, and uh, we try to collect uh, also different kind of, of aid for, from, um, uh, from uh, our international partner and uh, it's uh, like one of example how trade union mo uh, movement in Ukraine work together we don't work like uh, different trade union we work together and uh, even in 
our youth network. You know, um, we had a, a meeting on uh, on Sunday. We have a, a very big uh, youth net, uh, youth network meeting, youth network trade union meeting, and we uh, all of us say that now we sketch our difference. Now we are only like use network of trade union okay you can work like in public sector you can work in for example uh, nuclear uh, trade union or different kind of like health care or education trade union but now we are only use network only use network i mean and we have to work together because uh, if we talk about for example uh, <laughs> our nuclear um, power plant it's awful because uh, my friend, my, <laughs> my deputy of uh, uh, Youth Network of uh, Federation of Trade Union, now she work in uh, the Parisian NPP. And the Parisian NPP now it's total under control of Russian army. And yes, of course I'm worried because <laughs> uh, she is young woman and uh, uh, we have some contact. Uh, I can say her name because uh, you have to know. You have to know, like it's uh, it's like for her uh, safety. But I know that all of day, like today, tomorrow, uh, it's uh, so stressful for her because uh, uh, she don't doesn't know what can happen with with her with her family, and uh, some people from. Uh, a city where uh, um, where are uh, where, where is this um, uh, uh, NPP? Some people uh, try move on from this city because they don't want to be under Russian control. Uh, and uh, um, uh, yes, we want to to protect our friend, our member, for um, etc. Uh, also, uh, about my message to you, to our international partners. Uh, you know, I can uh, separate it like in two, in two points. Uh, the first one is like uh, our global message. Okay, all of our society and also our government, our president and all of our trade union, we ask uh, and we talk, please sky, uh, close the sky over Ukraine. Because um, today and yesterday and all of days, they bombing, they every time bombing uh, our houses, our hospitals, our parently house, uh, our structure, our cultural objects. And for example, the greatest city, Chernigiv, now totally bombed, Kharkiv, totally bombed. Some small city near Kiev, where I live my friends, where, are, where, where I was, for, for example, Irpin, for example, Bucha, they totally won. And when my friend, uh, my colleague from FPU, Volodymyr, he uh, said me that uh, because he live in Bucha, and he uh, and he said me, Ivana, uh, you know, I have to walk and um, and collect some arms, some legs, some bodies, and I know uh, him. And uh, he, we work with him uh, when we um, do some trade union events. And now uh, he said me this, uh, this awful thing for me, it's, um, I, can, uh, I can understand it, yeah. And I know uh, the level of his stress now. So at the first it's about closing the sky over Ukraine because we have to stop this bombing. Uh, okay, our army is very strong, and our air air protect is very strong because uh, they try to protect Kiev, they try to protect um, all all of our city. But even now, uh, you know where maybe you know where is our city Lviv, is the west of Ukraine near Poland's border. But they totally bombing air um, military airplane uh, in um, in Lviv, and died. Uh, for, um, for about 35 people. It's the west of Ukraine. Uh, yesterday, uh, during the night uh, in Chernivtsi, where, where I am now, we have an uh, alarm during five hours. It start at um, 2 a.m. and stopped at 7 a.m. So uh, yes, I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep because I don't know what can happen. And yes, I stay home. Uh, I was in my corridor because I live in the first floor. 
I don't go to the shelter because yes, uh, it's normal. I tire, a lot of people tire and we can run in every time to shelter and come back to shelter and come back. It's, um, it's, it's very, very hard. And uh, so we have to stop this bombing. Uh, the second one, well, what I want to say, it's about a peaceful mission, about peaceful mission from Red Cross and from OON. Uh, because uh, maybe uh, you read in your social, your social media. Uh, now we like, sorry for, for this sign, but we have like green humanitarian corridor. But what we have um, in real time, when our people, for example, from um, Mykolaiv, from um, Mariupol, they try to, to, to leave this city, Russian army start shooting and they killing killing people. For example, we, we have a uh, we have situation in Irpin when they killed uh, all family, father, mother, and two children. They killed them. Okay, now we haven't one family, but it's it's only one. There are a lot of a lot of example. So I know that it's decision um, uh, on level government about about this this um, uh, this corridor, but uh, I know that. Uh, you and in other country can do some influence to um, to, to to help for, for help to create this corridor. Uh, it's the, the second one. The third one. Uh, it's uh, okay if we can't close the sky over Ukraine. Uh, our army need some some airplane from NATO, for example, yeah, or some some weapon. It's like the third one. So <laughs> I know that, that some country deliver uh, some weapon from them, but, but it's like also one way how we can help our country. Uh, for um, a trade union movement, uh, my uh, chairman of my trade union, and I know that uh, these uh, things say a lot of um, uh, chairman of different trade union uh, in, uh, uh, in the same uh, international meeting that um, all of Russian trade union must be included from, from trade union movement, uh, world, world trade union movement, because a lot of them protect Putin decision. It's an uh, it's awful thing. And I, uh, and I, I know that we, we, we need to do it, because in a trade union movement in the world, we, we can have this, this example when trade unions supported the decision of uh, their uh, president to, 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 kill, uh, to kill people. Uh, for um, uh, the second part of my message, like local message, of course, I know that uh, you, have, um, you have some influence or also you, you, have, you, you can to be like our channel for sharing this information around the world. So you can um, help us in this process. Of course, if you can, you can help us, uh, I don't know, with some kind of, uh, kind of uh, aid of, of different, uh, I think uh, Great Britain and for example, London, uh, and uh, uh, you had this experience. And uh, um, I, I read some books, <laughs> I saw, watched some films, uh, historical films. And I know that you uh, have to understand our feeling because when um, in some international meeting ask me, Ivana, please uh, um, explain us what you feel. Uh, I feel the big pain now because um, I want to come back in Kyiv. I want to come back to my, uh, to my friends, to my work. And I don't want uh, to, um, to, to feel in this, um, uh, this care. I don't want to be afraid. I, don't, I, I want to live my, my, my life in, in democracy process. And, uh, and maybe it's all what, what I want to say, because mm -hmm. I know that you know like 100% uh, how live in war time. Now we live in war time. Now we have this. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, um, um, was a very stressful when I read information that 
a lot of uh, young women in Kherson was raped. For me, it was difficult. For me, it, it was difficult when I saw this image, when I saw a uh, um, uh, saw video uh, from um, Mariupol apparently house, when a lot of uh, women with children, uh, they they live, uh, they, they was in this parently house and this parently house was totally bombing and they died. And especially uh, today, um, we talked with our head of regional organization and uh, uh, our colleagues update us that uh, 100 children uh, uh, and their um, uh, parents uh, now died. And, and now these 100 children are without their parents. And uh, they was in in some safe place near Lviv. And when I saw this these small children, uh, for me, like for women, it's difficult. So um, it's it's all what I want to. I, I want I can to talk a, a lot of time, but um, I hope that you understand me and what what I want to to Good say moment. you and and to say uh, all people who watched uh, who who watch it now uh, us now in real time ivana thank you very much for that thank you very very much and a lot of what you said you've seen and you will see in the comments that people have submitted is nothing but solidarity and also the heartbreaking nature of your report thank you very much for that it, it i think it was really brave and courageous and, and impressive of you thank you um, our next speaker is Dennis Pilash. Dennis is an activist in the social movement of, of Ukraine. Um, as people speak, if they want to identify where they're speaking from, that's up to them. Obviously, we understand security issues as well, if you, if you don't wish to as well. Um, over to you, Dennis. Thank you. So, yeah, it's great to see you, friends, comrades, those who, whom we met in Kyiv just on the eve of this invasion. It's great to see John McDonnell. Um, it's, uh, it's a pity that we meet under such circumstances. Yes, as, as you see, as you know, uh, it uh, has been almost three weeks that Russia's the right-wing uh, dictatorship unleashed a unilateral aggression against Ukraine. And this led to, well, the Russian uh, forces killed thousands of civilians and actually break, broke the, the lives of uh, tens of millions. But millions were forced to flee to safer regions of Ukraine or abroad. And others are now um, hiding in shelters, in their basements, in their apartments, the metro in the streets uh, from the Russian shellings, from uh, the airstrikes. And it's uh, a truly existential horror, an everyday horror that uh, uh, seems unbearable for, for uh, tens of millions of people, actually. So, uh, and especially for the people who, who have small children, who have elderly parents, uh, people with disabilities, people in COVID hospitals, and so on and so on. You, you can continue this list. So um, it really uh, invokes some worst, darkest pages of our history, just like the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. And it also shows that it's Putin's Russia that uh, urgently needs to be uh, demilitarized and denazified. And actually, uh, yeah, also towns, like Ivana mentioned, these uh, Kyiv suburbs, like Ritin, or uh, towns in uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, Chastya, Izum, uh, Volnavakha, they, they have been almost completely destroyed. And uh, the city of Mariupol, it's like a new siege of uh, Leningrad. So it's, uh, it, it was cut off of uh, any uh, communications and people are starving and dying there from dehydration. And we can only estimate how many people uh, could, could have died there, probably thousands. 
so it's it's really um, a situation when uh, the, the the gravest the gravest situation in our uh, lifetime in Ukraine. But actually, it also uh, revealed that um, Russian aggression it met enormous resistance. From, from the Ukrainian, both the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian population. So you have thousands of people in these occupied cities that joining the peaceful protests, standing up to the armed uh, Russian soldiers, trying to stop the Russian uh, armed vehicles with their bare hands. And uh, well, now they are really threatened because yeah, the, the mayors of these cities uh, have been kidnapped. And it took uh, the, the occupiers a week to find some Quislings to collaborate because there is a total rejection of um, the occupation. And you have people, both Russian and Ukrainian speaking, men and women, mostly working class people who stand up to this aggression. Then you have um, and there hundreds of thousands of people who enlisted for the um, voluntary uh, self-defense units. And uh, most importantly, you have millions of essential workers and volunteers who just keep the things going and who uh, participate in humanitarian aid uh, projects. So actually, now I am in one of the safer cities, again, uh, uh, in, in the western part of Ukraine, near the Slovakian and Hungarian border. And it's now a, a hub for refugees uh, fleeing uh, to the west and humanitarian aid coming to the east. So um, you have thousands of people who are involved into um, this process of uh, collecting distribution, uh, helping people in need. Um, and again, you have people from uh, the unions, from both Federation of Trade Unions and Confederation of Free Trade Unions who are involved into these essential processes. For instance, the rail railroad workers, um, the state railroad company um, em employees, they, they do an enormous job to evacuate people to safer places. At the same time, you also have some neoliberal MPs who, in these harsh conditions, are thinking uh, of uh, passing some laws that will uh, worsen the work conditions for, for these people and uh, making it easier to sack them. So it's, uh, it's a real... Uh, I don't know, uh, but actually, uh, what's uh, what's the main main message uh, from from the Ukrainian left now? Um, it's that uh, well, you you see that it's a really people's war. It's a, a popular resistance, and it uh, desperately needs international solidarity. It needs uh, solidarity on a lot of levels starting from the basic level of um, unconditional support of the demand of complete withdrawal of Russian uh, forces from Ukraine. And um, then you have lots of other demands that are essential for the uh, persistence of Ukrainian uh, resistance. So, of course, uh, we need maximum help, both military and humanitarian maximum assistance for the people of Ukraine in this situation. We need maximum assistance for the refugees uh, from Ukraine. And we, we see that some, some governments like Boris Johnson's uh, that paint themselves as uh, very Ukrainian and friends of Ukraine, they are reluctant to uh, open the borders for uh, the refugees from Ukraine. And uh, that's why we salute those, those um, anarchist quarters who uh, occupied that mansion of a uh, putin oligarch in London and opened it to uh, refugees. Um, and we, we think that this process, it needs to be, um, well, it needs to be uh, really a systemic uh, seizure of these oligarch assets, uh, closing the loopholes in this tax haven system that uh, uh, well, helps the uh, oligarchs in, in Russia, in Ukraine, and so on, to uh, push their money. Um, and also to turn all these uh, confiscated 
funds and assets to help for um, for uh, refugees and also for the reconstruction of uh, Ukraine after the war. Uh, again, uh, we need uh, this also um, evokes the issue of cancellation of Ukrainian debt. I think uh, Yulia will elaborate on this uh, issue more, uh, but it also um, uh, linked to to a general economic assistance for for uh, Ukraine, it, both in times of war and in times of uh, the uh, we hope to return to a peaceful life and to rebuild the country. Um, and again, uh, we have uh, you, you can see as our demands they transcend to something bigger, and uh, in order to stop. Uh, this authoritarian war machine that is Putin's regime, we need to put maximum pressure on it. At this moment, it's really urgent because every day we lose uh, enormous uh, number of lives. You know, just, just today, uh, I, I could read the uh, uh, reports of um, some random executions uh, in the occupied regions that uh, some People whom I heard of, they 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 were killed. Um, some anarchist guy was killed in Kharkiv. A physicist was killed near Kiev, and so on and so on. So uh, again, and it's also uh, in order to uh, not to, to to get this war to be prolonged, not to uh, turn this into a never-ending uh, disaster, because. Um, it, it has already uh, done uh, enormous um, destruction throughout the country. And we can only uh, imagine what it can be if you have like, with, with uh, um, so many human lives uh, lost and so many human lives broken and people scattered all, all over Ukraine and abroad. So uh, we see that yeah, we, we have the resistance and Ukraine will endure, but uh, the, uh, now it's is really a pressure, uh, a pressing question of uh, how fast can we, can we force Russian authorities that have been denying Ukraine's agency and they have been denying uh, a real negotiation process, even on these basic questions of ceasefire, of uh, humanitarian cor corridors and so on. Uh, th that is to be done now. And again, then you have uh, bigger questions uh, about uh, how we got to the situations that um, such regimes were uh, tolerated and appeased and also how they could benefit from the global um, capitalist system. And uh, this also brings in these questions, uh, for instance, about um, green energy transition, because uh, Russia and other murderous regimes like Saudi Arabia with their uh, criminal Yemen war and mass executions, they are based on these fossil fuel empires. And uh, it's really about uh, questioning like the current system of uh, neoliberal capitalism worldwide. So uh, you, you see that that we, we are really in need of, of this solidarity and we are grateful for having um, you as the representatives of, um, um, of uh, uh, trade unions and uh, the political left, the labor in, in UK, uh, standing up in solidarity with the uh, common uh, people in Ukraine and uh, trying to uh, push the uh, situation to uh, a closer um, victory for uh, the Ukrainian and uh, um, defeat for uh, a murderous authoritarian regime in, in Moscow. So uh, let's uh, let's stay together. Let's stay in solidarity, and uh, we will prevail. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks. For absolute solidarity. Absolute solidarity. Thank you very much for that analysis. Our next speaker is Yulia. Yachenko, um, she's an author and scholar and obviously also part of the uh, Ukrainian social movement. Yulia, over to you. Thank you very much, John. Um, thank you, the organizers. It's 
Uh, it's uh, great being a part of this panel, yet it's, uh, of course, uh, I, I would rather uh, have this meeting uh, uh, on a different occasion. And uh, a number of people on this call were, were part of the delegation with which uh, we together came to Kiev some three weeks ago. And oh boy, what, does, what, what a difference does, did those weeks make? Um, it's still some sort of a surreal dream, you know. There are I'm I'm in Vinitsa, which is relatively quiet. There are sirens that we hear regularly, um, and uh, not unlike uh, earlier speakers, we um, yeah. After having have run to the cellar of my mother's house a number of times, we just simply don't anymore. Uh, we kind of we listen to sounds of fire. If we hear jets of fire, then then we know that we may need to do something else, uh, because otherwise you just don't get any sleep and you don't and you do not get anything done and you're in a permanent state of stress. Well, not that it's nowhere, but you know you kind of get used to the horror much sooner than you you think you would. Um, sadly, uh, but compared to a lot of other Ukrainians, we are we're faring okay-ish. Uh, for now, and we're not planning to leave up until it gets absolutely necessary. I have applied for the family visas. I'm a British citizen. I've, uh, September will have been uh, 18 years since I've come to the UK, and I've been a citizen for a number of years. I've applied for those family visas, and I had my own giggle at uh, how ridiculous the system is. So I've applied for those for my mom and my sister and my sister's son. Obviously, my, my sister's husband can't leave neither can my father nor is he willing to he said that i'll shoot if, at least a few russians before he falls and he's 65 so that's yeah they want to die on their land defending it um uh, kind of a couple of words about british visa system before i move on to the ukrainian debt and like my comrades from ukraine will have will already discussed some of the other important issues that ukraine is facing and uh, i think vitaly will add a bit more um uh John, since and, and Mick, because you're in the in the parliament, uh, it would be really useful if you've passed into our dear Priti Patel that one of the things that really wouldn't hurt is at very least translating the pages of the visa application form. Uh, I've I've seen that before. Like you know, Ukrainian is not even in the drop down of languages. Russian is, and the, the Russian pages they have the headings in Russian and the rest of the pages are in English in kind of a bit of a legalese that I, it's it's ridiculous really after years and years of home office and the charges that they impose on people they can't get someone to so much as translate the pages uh, it is rather ludicrous if you ask me uh, one of the other things they ask is the uh, passport details and dates of birth and names of all the relatives that you have who are not planning to come with you on the visit for reasons unknown to humanity but then again, we're dealing with Priti Patel, who's continuing the uh, hostile immigration policy that Theresa May has introduced, who I had my own brush with that I will not divulge in, uh, about right now. But back to the issues of Ukraine. So one of the things that I, uh, as John already mentioned, I'm a scholar of Ukraine, I'm a Ukrainian, I'm from Vinita, then I lived in Kiev and studied in Kiev. And from an interpreter, I became a political economist uh, because there are urgent problems in Ukraine that I couldn't turn a blind eye to. And uh, one of the things that I'm working with social movement right now after the uh, delegation have left and I started to try to help whichever way I could, um, is uh, we're now organizing a campaign around the foreign debt of Ukraine to try to alleviate some of the pressure on the government immediately in the short term, long term, and interim and medium term um, regard. So I'll speak for the next, uh, I'm gonna try to keep it neat. So I kind of, I've made some notes, I'm gonna read it out. Uh, I'm gonna try to make it neat uh, as to like why this, this debt is important. And I'm, I'm, I'm sending this to papers later because Ukraine, Ukraine's debt is very important, not least because Ukraine right now is fighting a European and indeed a global war and, uh, and, the, and, the, and Ukrainian debt needs to be seriously reconsidered. Um, 
because despite the courageous fighting spirit of Ukraine's leaders, uh, only time can tell us with certainty how long the war will last or how far it can spread. Russians air, Russian airstrikes at their base near Lviv, where Ukraine NATO training center is based, is a, is a clear near miss upper hook in the face of NATO, who remain adamant in their proclamations of staying out of the conflict. But yet, of course, everybody on this call knows that indirect engagement uh, is, is already there, and so does Putin. And that's, that's you know, uh, if you are sending weapons to a country, then you know there are only two. There only there is only one conclusion that can be made, and uh, Putin is trying to uh, sort of provoke, if you like. I really don't like that word in this context. Um, uh, NATO forces into a further escalation, not least to legitimize his uh, narrative of Russia being the permanent victim of the West. Ukraine is largely, the, in any case, uh, nevertheless, on its own in its heroic halting of the Russian imperialistic ambition at the gate of Europe, and it's unwillingly sacrificing its people, its cities, and its, first, its infrastructure, and it's subjecting its soil to the ecocidal debris of warfare, and the country needs desperate and urgent help. It remains one of the poorest and most indebted countries in Europe, uh, which now is forced to defend itself against the aggression and military offensive of the Russian army, that is the second largest army in the world. And no matter what our military commanders are telling us about how little of the military arsenal Russia has left, the bombs keep coming, the cities keep being bombed, uh, people keep being killed. Uh, and up until that stops, Ukraine really needs help, not least with the budgetary expenditure on arms, humanitarian needs and medical needs of the wounded uh, that have grown exponentially. And in the aftermath of the war, of course, Ukraine will also need money to reconstruct its homes and infrastructure, clean up and decontaminate cities and the countryside. And in such conditions, state debt servicing is not only is, is the only um, state debt, debt servicing um, is not possible for Ukraine, and it, it it only can be possible if it is to forfeit its the servicing of the needs of its military and its attempt to provide the world where it was free from happening. Uh, and the most urgent needs of the people cannot be met if Ukraine prioritizes, which it has to, um, if the debt uh, is not canceled, or at least uh, there is a moratorium on temporary moratorium on payments, um, Ukraine will not be able to, to kind of to do both at the same time. So not only are the, inter are the, are the urgent needs of the people a priority, a thorough planning for a post, post war re economic reconstruction must be thought of already to which, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that can only mean one thing, that it is time for large scale fiscal activism. This is a narrative that already was started here in, in the last four years or so in the IMF, uh, instead of a wartime austerity in the name of debt servicing. This can only be achieved via coordinated intentional action, international intentional action, and there, and there is capacity to do that should there be the will. Chaotic borrowing and antisocial debt conditionality was a result of total oligarchization, uh, and unwilling to fight the wealthy in Ukraine, the, the Ukrainian oligarchs, not least because of the entanglement of oligarchs and, uh, the, and the parties in charge and different state agencies, because the state rulers kept, state rulers kept getting more debt instead of bringing their oligarchs to, uh, to account. And so more loans were issued, more conditionality was pushed on, and the country is in a, is in a straight jacket uh, of debt and debt conditionality. The, at, at this moment, Ukraine already requested additional one point for billion via rapid financing mechanisms with IMF, which should be repaid according to IMF rules within three and a quarter to five years. Um, and under those rules as well, a member country requesting RFI assistance, this is a quote, is required to cooperate with IMF to make efforts to solve its balance payment difficulties and to describe the, the general economic policies that it proposes to follow. Prior actions may be required where warranted, end of quote. So there is, again, like, again, there is more conditionalities. Again, there is a need to, balance, to make balance of payments work and so on and so forth. And the problems of that are being solved with yet more debt. But the country is in the state of war and it needs full-fledged assistance that is supposed to be able to, so that, it's, so that it can be able to uh, fulfill those conditions. Um, and, and without that kind of full-fledged assistance, it will not be able to fulfill the conditions that have been pushed on it. So we're kind of in a bit of a catch-22. And the bottom line is this, that most measures that are in place have been developed to deal with natural disasters or exogenous economic shocks, for example, packed currency collapse or something along the lines. And they're peacetime options, and they are not fit for a situation that Ukraine, as a target of military aggression, finds itself in right now. Let's remind ourselves how IMF was founded in the Bretton Woods uh, Conference in 1944. It was, it was founded 
to prevent destabilization of the global financial systems. And in their own words, quote, the IMF primary mission is to ensure the stability of the international monetary system, the system of exchange rates, international payments that enable countries and their citizens to transact with each other. And to fulfill that mission, they need to provide advice to member countries and promote policies designed to foster economic stability, reduce vulnerability to economic and financial crisis, and raise living standards, end of quote. With throwing more debt and conditions right now in Ukraine, it is impossible to achieve those aims. So I think we need to go back. We had these conversations in the social movement meetings. We need to go back to those initial um, missions of these Bretton Woods institutions, uh, and then further uh, or, or banks such as, for example, European Bank for Construction and Development that already actually has issued some uh, 2 billion euro resilience package um, and uh, aimed not least at debt forbearance measures fuel imports, emergency liquidity finance, and emergency reform support. So there are some already examples of something slightly more important happening, but there needs to be much more of it. And we have seen that kind of thinking uh, under Christine Lagarde, who is now in charge of ECB. When she was in charge of IMF, we saw this kind of a, a bit of a change in the narrative uh, at the IMF. Uh, where they were talking about fiscal activism, like especially the research division rather than the policy implementation division of the IMF. They were talking about fiscal activism instead of austerity because there was a wide, wide scale recognition like, well, William Easterly was warning about it years ago, but that didn't land anywhere with the IMF. Uh, but th there was a recognition that actually austerity doesn't bring growth and doesn't eradicate inequality. So a different approach is needed, and this kind of fiscal activism. So there needs to be some sort of large scale rewriting um, of fund loans program to allow those, uh, those uh, fantastic plans to actually become reality. So we need to move beyond the rhetoric. There is that rhetoric already, but it needs to be implemented. Because Ukraine is one of the largest debtors with IMF, among other lenders, and having to its own device and having and being left to its own devices in a war on behalf of the Western world uh, can lead to disillusionment with the promise of the international liberal and economic order. And if a country in Ukraine's position is left unsupported, what hope is there for anyone else? What is the incentive to contribute, partake, and follow the rules? The world is watching what is happening in Ukraine now, and Ukraine must be helped. Otherwise, this whole premise of the so-called rules, order, and support is just a sham. So that is something that we're putting a lot of effort behind. We already have a lot of support. We've started, uh, uh, we started our own petition and through another you know, Europe is possible. There is a petition we're working with the Dead Jubilee campaign and a number of other uh, stakeholders for a lack of a better word uh, that I'm not going to list here because we're still kind of working out our position. Socialny Ruch has already established relationships with a lot of sympathetic trade unions and political parties across Europe. We're trying to build momentum uh, and get signatories that Ukraine is no country in the state of war should be prioritizing debt repayments when it needs military, when it needs to support its military, it needs to feed its children who are in the shelters, it needs to, it needs to buy medical supplies. So we're also trying to, to make this into a case together with the Dead Jubilee campaign that would allow for an, automat for, 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 an, uh, for an extraordinary protocol to be triggered automatically should any other country find itself in this kind of situation. So there shouldn't have to be an additional campaign all the time. Well, there is a lot, you know, kind of immediate short-term and long-term actions that can happen, but I'm just going to put in the chat Add the link to our petition is should any of you want to share it or familiarize it to sign but this is you know one of the things that we're doing with social network beyond uh, and and be, and uh, besides helping um house the internally displaced people and helping refugees move and getting medications to people in the shelter is is trying to think like you know how can we enable this country to actually withstand the crisis but also rebuild itself should this crisis come to end. I'm going to stop at that. Thank you so much for your attention. Yuria, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the proposals and the campaign that you're waging on debt, which I was, uh, found to be incredibly creative. Thank you very much for that, Yuria. Our next speaker is Vitaly um, Judin. Vitaly is a solicitor active in the Defence of Trade Unions and a member of the, um, the social movement of Ukraine as well. Vitaly, over to you. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your solidarity. I'm very glad to hear all from you. I'm glad to hear people from uh, UK, from Ukraine, uh, from 
other European countries. Of course, now we are living in the hardest time. Of course, it's uh, very it's very scary to to sleep. Now I'm uh, far away from my home in Kiev. I'm on the west uh, of Ukraine, and uh, it's uh, not safe, as it was uh, told before me today, because of the airstrike. But I can't imagine what feeling people which are blocked in the Mariupol, which are blocked in Volnovakha, uh, which are living under the Russian occupation in Melitopol, Berdyansk, and other Ukrainian cities, and they cannot allow to satisfy their basic needs in food, in water, in medicine, etc. But I am sure that those hard times, they are temporary. I think that we will overcome those obstacles and we will live in the peaceful and fair country. And I'm very calm because I've never received so much international support as today from the comrades from the whole world. Thank you very much. It gives us powers to continue to solve our everyday problems and to see the future. And of course, we think that uh, Ukraine will be more fair country, more democratic, <clears throat> more <clears throat> healthy country, of course. But uh, there are a lot of work. And which problems I think, I see? First of all, it's uh, the grave military danger from the Russian Federation. Our people are fighting using all their possibilities. Some people are fighting on the front line. Some people are working in the hospitals, in the transport enterprises. And uh, some people even making the passive resistance in the occupied cities. They showing they do not fear the Russian military. I'm proud that Ukrainian people, it is a synonym for the anti-imperialism in today's world. And our people, they are very brave. But also we are fighting not only against Putin's military machine, but we are fighting against unfair global capitalism. Ukraine is not only the victim of the Russian aggression, but uh, also it is a victim of uh, unfair global system of relations. Our country is deeply debted by the IMF and other uh, creditors. Our country is uh, damaged by unfair conditions from IMF and the other institutions. And the, our people understand that we cannot stand in this war if we do not change our social system. It is impossible to win the war if we will not confiscate the wealth of the biggest Ukrainian oligarchs. We just have no other way. Program and demands of social movement or social ruch looked radical before the war, but now our organization, I think, has the only realistic program and demands in those conditions because Ukraine have 
no other sources except pushing on the wealth of our oligarchs. We should take money from the biggest capitalists of Ukraine. We should take money from the Russian oligarchs. We should uh, fighting for the cancellation of uh, Ukrainian debt. And uh, we should uh, fighting against uh, the offshore uh, and the uh, tax uh, havens in the world because they help uh, Russia to avoid uh, damage from the sanctions. And uh, one uh, features, uh, one more feature that I, I want uh, to admit, it is uh, problems of the ordinary people. Of course, war did not cancel the class struggle and the social problems. Our uh, nurses and the railway uh, workers, they under the big pressure of their obligations on the workplaces, but their salaries are still low as they were before the war and it's terrible i received a lot of uh, applications from the nurses which uh, work in the whole day in the hospitals and after the work day they should uh, go to the volunteer centers and uh, take uh, even additional obligations without uh, additional payment. The reason it is uh, the deadly budget deficit. Our uh, government should get more money. But of course, their policy is still neoliberal. They think, for example, Minister of Finance, Sergei Marchenko, uh, that uh, Ukraine should not demand cancellation of debt because uh, our uh, financial ally, elite will think that uh, Ukrainians, they are not uh, good partners because they don't repay their debts. I think it's uh, total bullshit. We should take money everywhere where we, we can, and the debt cancellation is one of the most uh, fair ways to obtain needed money. And uh, today I was shocked by the initiative of our uh, member of parliament, Halina Tretyakova, she is deputy of Verkhovna Rada, which uh, proposed to cancel labor legislation in the time of war. The, she made a draft law which mm, gives employers uh, an opportunity to exploit our uh, workers 60 hours a week instead of 40 hours today. The <clears throat> guarantee on the vacation will be abolished. There were no influence of, of trade unions. Every worker can be have his uh, labor contract terminated if his uh, employer will uh, had uh, such decision. It's a terrible law. I, I hope that uh, it would uh, not be, uh, would not pass the parliament, <clears throat> but uh, it shows how our politicians see the solution they think that the majority of people 
should bear the cost of uh, this war. But we think that it's totally unfair and it would be evident. Our organization, social movement, will pursue its aims to make Ukraine more social and democrat democratic and free country. And uh, we will uh, use every possibility to defend our country and our social rights. And I think that international pressure from the all leftists, anti-imperialists and the socialists will help to ensure fair decisions in Ukraine. I think that our government, <clears throat> our parliament could avoid the decisions which can make the life of our people even more worse. So thank you for your support. Long live uh, international anti-war movement. Long live international socialism. Vitaly Dudin, Socialny Ruch, Ukraine. Vitaly, thank you very much, Vitaly. That was superb. Thank you very much. And obviously the expressions of solidarity you're seeing on the screen already and in the chat as well. Thank you for that. And also for uh, your critique of this threat to trade union rights as well, which has to be resisted. Thank you for that. Our next speaker is Elena I Ivanova. Elena is uh, from another Europe is Possible, so one of the sponsors of tonight's meeting, and she's been engaged in solidarity with Ukraine throughout. Elena, over to you. Um, thank you, Hedron. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, I want to start by saying it's wonderful to see your faces, Julia, Ivana, Denis, Vitali. Uh, every time we organize these meetings, every time I I see you again and I see that you're you're well and you're and and you're relatively safe, um, you know, it, it it gives a spark of hope to all of us. So it's it's really important. As much as your words, just seeing you and keeping this connection going is is really important for us as well and i hope you take some strength and 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 some hope from from us as well um i will be very brief because the people we are actually here to listen to um are our ukrainian comrades and also because i have covid at the moment so i start coughing very soon <clears throat> um but you you've already heard that uh, for for our comrades in in Ukraine this is not some realpolitik uh, board game um there are already millions of lives that have been scarred by this war and Ukraine will never be the same but when i listen to you i know it will be better it will be a more just country it will have a stronger democratic system um, and it will be a fairer country to workers and ordinary people. Um, I do believe that, and uh, I know that you believe as well. Uh, <clears throat> and every day as I watch the videos of blasts happening in residential neighborhoods that look exactly like the neighborhoods where I grew up, the same gray bu buildings with, with numerous flats and i know the sort of community and and social life that these that these places actually support and um the connections that are being destroyed through putin's bombs um i actually think back um to syria um and i i know that we talk a lot about um this division between different um, refugees and different different people fleeing war and how um, Ukrainians are Europeans. So for some reason, we must feel differently about that. But actually, the people that know best exactly what you're going through are the Syrians, the Afghans, the Yemeni. 
um, the people who have experienced war, they, they know what you're going through and they and I know they're with you. And perhaps we've not done um, our best to protect all victims of war, but we have a chance to start a, a new, a fairer system. Um, so I do think that it's incredibly important that we organize around um, the rights of Ukrainian refugees as a starting point for a better asylum system for everyone, everyone who experiences conflict. Um, and I want to encourage in, anyone who's in London tomorrow to go to the demonstration at the Home Office. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to say. <clears throat> and the other thing I wanted to say is that this is, we're seeing the end of Putin's regime. We, it may not feel like it right now. It may not feel like it for, for, the, for the people who are at the receiving end of, of those blasts. But this is the beginning of the end. We are going to defeat him and we are going to build a better um, world, not just in Ukraine, but also in Russia. And um, we have to hold on to that hope, but also we have to support the people who are actively involved in, in that struggle. And that's the people who are protesting the Russian regime back at home, but also the people who are fighting and resisting, whether that's through picking up a gun to protect their home and their loved ones, or through picking a safe route to try and, and, and escape and protect their, their loved ones. Um, there is no, and we, we're in no position to judge how people decide to um, <clears throat> defend themselves and protect their freedom. Our job is to listen to you, to stand with you, to offer you practical support, all the material support that we can offer we give to you and we're here to listen to your words and hopefully give you some sucker and give you some um, strength that you can borrow from us uh, until we can see you in a, in, in a better day and better circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much for that. And I wish you a speedy recovery from the COVID. Okay. Thank you very much for coming on as well. Um, our next series of speakers were all part of a labor movement delegation which visited Ukraine on the eve of the Russian invasion. Um, they were there to show solidarity with the trade union and socialist and civil society, um, which was facing the threat of that attack. And as, as others have said, uh, things have moved on since then. Um, we've, we've asked an, uh, the delegation to just explain their views and, and again, their ideas on where we go from here. Can I apologise? I'll be leaving shortly to a series of votes in the in the Commons chamber, and when I do, Chris Ford will take over the chair, and then I'll be back as soon as those votes are over. Okay. So uh, I'd like to introduce um, Julie Ward, who was a member of the delegation. Julie, you will know she was a um, was a member of the European Parliament for Northwest England region and active on solidarity campaigns like this throughout. Uh, sorry, right, I'm in a very improvised situation here in the Amsterdam right now. Um, so first of all, um, thank you so much, John, for being with us this evening. And thank you for, um, you know, being so outspoken, uh, saying the right things at the right time to the right people. And I really appreciate that. Um, I also just want to say how amazing, Ivana, you are. From that meeting we had on Monday, February 21st, when you were sitting in the back row and I said, I want to hear from the young person in the room. I want to hear what the young woman who is the organiser for the Federation has to say to young people in the UK about trade union activism and organising. And I extended uh, an invitation to have an exchange with you, to bring you here, to share your experiences. And even though I think we knew the invasion was coming, we still had that incredible hope about what we could do together. And I think that this gathering today, all these, you know, we've had about 200 people in this gathering and it is what we can do together. We have to kind of hold on to that. Um, and just wonderful again to see Dennis and Vitali also. Um, my, when I was elected in 2014, 
to represent the northwest of England. You know, I had no idea what being a politician would mean. I just had a, a kind of a completely um, visceral uh, and very emotional desire to defend the social Europe that I believe is possible. That's kind of what, what my mission was. And the very first opportunity I had to speak in the European Parliament plenary was a debate on Ukraine. It was the very first speech I ever made as an elected representative. And it was really important for me because I had in 2011 participated in a year long cultural management exchange project with Ukrainian cultural organizations and civil society organizations. And I had met and worked with and made lifelong friends with people in many different cities across Ukraine. So for me, this is very, very personal. Um, it's yes, it's political, but it's also about my friends. It's about my friends and my colleagues who are still working in culture and education and in civil society. And um, I, when we were on the delegation, I didn't stay in the hotel. I did a homestay. I stayed with one of my friends. So I had a slightly different experience from everybody else because you know we would do our visits every day and our meetings and they were really really important but the, at the end of each day I would be going back to Daria and Morat's house and playing with a two-year-old child and we would be eating together and um, talking about what we could do together in the future uh, you know as people who cared about the same things so it has been really, really traumatic for me to watch my friends um, lose their homes, flee, uh, or, or to stay and help in the, in the efforts that are being made. And I just want to salute everybody, whatever the choice people are making to do right now, to defend democracy, to defend their culture, their homeland, their neighbors. You know, thank you so much for everything you do. Um, I, um, I, you know, the war has been going on since 2014 and it hasn't been in the media. And one of the things that people are not speaking about is what happened in Crimea. And the, the plight of the Crimean Tatars never makes the media. And yet in the European Parliament, it was an issue that I took on and I met with families and I worked with human rights organizations and I learned about the details of the terrible human rights violations that this minority uh, group were experiencing. And on the Monday evening, 21st, when uh, the news came through that Putin had signed into, you know, had, had recognized constitutionally with his with the signing of the document, the, um, the, the uh, Eastern Republics in, in the Donbass area, um, we were actually at the Center for Civil Liberties in Kiev, and we were listening to the stories, to the heartbreaking stories of the relatives of Crimean Tatars who are imprisoned and held hostage by the Kremlin. And I think one of the things that we have to do is to, is to really expose, you know, not just uh, the political games that Putin has been playing, um, uh, and the and the the kind of oligarchs that exist in London, and you know the failure, if you like, of um, Ukraine of, of the Ukrainian political system to really stand up for people. But we really, really also have to expose what Putin has been doing to minority groups. You know, he is no friend to LGBT people. He is no friend to women. He is no friend to minorities. You know, and and so right across the board, there, there's a lot of things that we have to be talking about. Um, so, and this war isn't just a war that's happening on the ground. It is an information war, right? And this information war has also been happening for a long time. In 2014, in, I was asked as an MEP to be the rapporteur for a report on propaganda against the EU. And in my naivety, I thought it was going to be about UKIP, and it wasn't. It was about Russia. So in 2014, in the European Parliament, we were already looking 
at the extensive troll farms, at all the disinformation of Russia Today and Sputnik. And we were writing about how, we, how the EU um, could address this issue, setting up special units, training people, doing media literacy programs, you know, the whole thing. And yet, in the UK, it seemed that we were just missing this completely. Nobody was talking about it. And yet, you know, Putin was rubbing his hands at Brexit, rubbing his hands at Trump being elected in the US, rubbing his hands at um, Marine Le Pen uh, gaining lots of support, rubbing his hands when the Dutch referendum went against the Ukrainian visas in the first time. And it's because his hands were all over those political democratic processes. Um, and so information is really, really important right now. And uh, last Thursday, the last independent broadcaster in Russia closed down uh, because of his new law where you're not allowed to call it a war, you have to call it a special military operation. So one of the things I want to do is to say to everybody here, please support Medusa, which is this independent broadcasting organization. It is setting up outside of the confines of Russia. It is now um, going to be broadcast in English, I think. And the uh, American left organization, Mother Jones, sent an email earlier today, which I received, which has um, ways that you can uh, give support to this independent broadcasting media organization because we have to counter the narrative that so many Russian people on the ground are now uh, lapping up and believing because they have no other source from which to uh, take their information. Um, now, I'm not a TikTok user, but TikTok apparently is one of the social media platforms that people can still access in Russia. And um, I would say to everybody here, get savvy, get on TikTok and amplify the truth so that the people on the ground in Russia can hear the counter narrative to Putin's lies. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is that our mission was hugely important, not because of who we are, because of, but because of what we stood for. And what we stood for was for the right of the left, the, the democratic socialist left, progressive left in Ukraine, to hope and work for a better future for everybody. And to have some of our people on the left in the UK and across Europe and in America deny that possibility is, I felt was really appalling. We in the UK are fighting for our, our own democratic socialist. And all of us um, in another Europe are doing that right across Europe too. And I just felt that we had to stand up for people in the trade union movement, for people who have been speaking here tonight, for their right to have their revolution, for their right to have their progressive socialist left, um, left country you know, with, um, against the oligarchs of whatever kind they were. So um, thanks very much for everybody being here today. Um, I'll put in the chat, if I can, that link to Medusa, okay. Thanks, Julie. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. And thank you for going on that delegation. It was important in the delegation that we had representatives of the trade union movement. And we've now got two speaking now. The first is Chris Kitchen, who's the General Secretary of the National Union Mine Workers. Chris. Thank you, John. And thank you, everybody, for, for attending tonight and, and sh you know, showing support. Um, it, uh, it was it was a, a privilege to be part of the delegation to Kiev. Um, the NUM's shown support to Ukrainian miners for, for over 10 years now. Um, and I've got immense respect for the people that we met while we're on the delegation. Um, quite surprised to realize that given that there were 150,000 Russians camped out on the borders, that the trade unions and the socialist groups that we met in the Ukraine and the civil rights groups all had similar issues to what we've got in the UK, trying to protect their 
their members, the workers' rights, the health and safety, um, and and how they they just got used to living with the threat of the invasion, um, even with the escalation of the of the troops around them. Um, I think that from talking to the to the mining union um, representatives that we met, the realization of of how much they'd suffered since 2014 with the, the Russian annexing of Crimea and the arming of the separatists in the in the eastern Donbass region and the and the 40 mines that had been closed and the subsequent job losses and poverty that had resulted from that. Um, and I, I just realized that you know for the last eight years the West has been turned a blind eye to to what's been happening. And while we've all gone for the dash for gas, maybe that's played a part in, in Putin's thinking that he could just continue and, and step up the action to, to invade the whole of the Ukraine. And, you know, that's something that, that we need to, to accept as a responsibility of us, that, that we've played a part in allowing that to happen. Um, but no, our solidarity with the people of the Ukraine you know, they've got to win the war. We've got to defeat Putin. And, and then we've got to assist, you know, the Ukrainians to rebuild their country and, and improve it. Um, we're, all, we're all in the same, in the same boat, if you like. So that's, that's all I've, I've got to say on, on today, but thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for all the support and solidarity that the National Union Mine Workers has been given to the Ukrainian trade unions over these many years. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce our next speaker, which is Mick Whelan, General Secretary of the Train Drivers Union, Aslev, who also went on that important delegation. Mick, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank before. you, Chris. It's so great to see so many colleagues and friends that we met in the Ukraine. To my eternal shame, I was probably the one who at least about the Ukraine when I went. Everybody else had an affinity. Everybody else had worked there before. You know, we talk about fighting neoliberalism. We talk about our class. We talk about our aspirations, about how we want to change our world and how we want to do it through international solidarity. But what struck me was the people. Take the message back. We are not the aggressors. We have waited eight years for Putin's war. This has been coming. We need your support. We need you to amplify our voices. We need you to counteract the misinformation that's going to be out there. And of course, Mr. Putin is now with his war, doesn't even want to tell his own people in Russia, it's a war. If you use the terminology war in Russia, you go to prison. It's great to see 13,000 protesters out in the streets arguing against his war, arguing against about what he's trying to do and the misinformation put him out there. But what he hasn't recognized, it's the strength of ordinary working people. What he hasn't recognised is all those train drivers moving hour after hour people to safety. All those people who normally draw buses in the metro systems, taking people to the borders. All those people doing 10, 14, 16 hours in makeshift hospitals. And a real passion of the people. This idea that he was going to roll the people of the Ukraine over in four days. That he was just going to take it over and it becomes yesterday's chip paper and yesterday's news. Is not the case. And the world is looking and the world is watching and the Ukrainians will win. And then when they win, as we've heard today, they will rebuild their society along the lines of the democracy that they want. But we have to listen to the voices such as Yulia and others who said to have that political voice, they also need the economic means to do so. So when the Ukrainian wins, and once we've given the humanitarian aid, and once we've given the wherewithal to build their country in the image that they want to, we've then got to allow them, right, to cancel the debt, to move forward. So if the message from tonight is anything, it is that people everywhere have to stop this obnoxious war, have to highlight what Putin is doing to the people of Ukraine, and then have to commit that once it's over, we will still stand with the Ukrainian people. We will help them rebuild their society and we will build a better world for everybody going forward because that's quite simply what the people of Ukraine want. Thank you. Thank you, Mick. Thank you very much indeed. Main words, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Paul Mason, who was also on the, uh, the delegation, journalist and author, 
uh, and been a strong support of Ukraine in this time of war. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris. I, I too have COVID and uh, I should be able to get through everything, I hope. Uh, and I'll try and keep it brief. So the last three weeks should teach us one thing, to take everything Putin says literally. Stop looking for subtext and ambiguities. The draft treaties he issued in December say it all. Once he has smashed Ukraine and forced it into puppet state status or partitioned Ukraine and destroyed the cities and the ecosystem, because in the Donbass, occupied Donbass, the ecosystem is already destroyed, he will do the same thing to Moldova, to Poland, to the Baltic states, to Finland, because all these countries fit into the con concept of post-Soviet space, which should be under the control or at least f enforced neutrality by Moscow. So Ukraine's struggle is not just about national sovereignty and respect for international law. It's the front line of the defense of democracy in Europe. And that's a difficult thing for many of us on the left to understand because we have spent our whole lives criticizing our own democracy, attacking the crimes of our own militaries in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Ireland, in the case of, U of the UK. It's a very strange place to be to have to understand that we are no part of a, a, a targeted international bloc whose existence as a democratic West relies on the defeat of Putin in Ukraine and on both the solidification of a different Europe, I'm going to argue of a different NATO, and the transformation of our own countries as we do it. I want to say to you, you know, because look, whatever else there is, for example, everybody knows that Finland has been home to the most advanced universal basic income uh, 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 experiments. There is no UBI experiment in a Finland under Russian control. You know, LGBTQ free zones will be Eastern Europe if Putin controls Eastern Europe. So I want to say to our guests from Ukraine, we in the British Labour movement are with you. Putin has support only from parts of the financial elite in Britain, from the far right, GB News, Tommy Robinson, and sadly, from a small faction of the far left who have hailed Russian troops as peacekeepers and defenders. I'll say a bit more about them in a minute. What matters is we turn this mass support. The pollsters are telling us, I went to a private pollsters meeting last week, that's where I got COVID, and, and they were saying it's an incredible moment of upsurge of support for Ukraine in the British people across all classes and all political factions. We need to turn that support into more. Demand the British government goes on arming the Ukrainian state. I mean, there have been probably three or 4,000 short range anti-tank missiles sent. That probably means they've run out. It means the factories in Belfast and elsewhere in the UK have to crank them out just to make sure the British army in Estonia has enough. We need to keep the pressure on to keep supplying them. Um, when there's a ceasefire, I think a ceasefire might happen. What will happen then is that all the people who've been quiet because they're embarrassed about what they've previously said will step forward and say, oh, well, now we should drop the sanctions. The sanctions are hurting people. Maybe, you know, now's the time to, to uh, you know, to, 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 to roll back from the support. Um, forget cancelling the debt. No, we need to keep the pressure on. We need to shut down all... Uh, and pursue all sources of Kremlin disinformation. Maybe people will say, oh, well, we should let Russia today back. Let Sputnik back. No, I think we need to keep the pressure on and increase it. We have to congratulate the Ukrainian people and their armed forces for fighting Putin's army to a standstill. We on the delegation met the young people of the uh, 112th Territorial Defense Brigade. And those people now are at risk to their lives. I don't know if they're all still alive. But the point is, um, it's very easy to otherize the military situation. We all watch it on Telegram and think, I'm glad that's not me. We must send, by our intermediaries, congratulations and support to them as they carry on fighting because they are, with every victory, they are making Putin's strategic situation very difficult. Now, they're paying the price in the form of, of destruction of cities, kidnap of elected mayors, and the organized slander of victims by the Russian ministries, like what happened with uh, the poor woman who got killed uh, in the uh, Mariupol hospital bombing. But uh, there is worse to come, I have to say. 
the attack on Yavoriv, this training center, which has been a NATO training center under Partnership for Peace for many years, openly, it's not a secret base. Um, it was not just a signal to NATO, we can attack 15 kilometers from the border. It, it, it was carried out by planes and missiles that could easily carry chemical or nuclear weapons. It was, it was a demonstration that we are prepared to do, that if we have to, we can do it. Uh, remember, Putin's playbook in Syria includes chemical attacks. He wrote the Russian playbook for so-called nuclear de-escalation, where they fire off one tactical nuclear weapon to shock the West. Um, we have to be prepared for that moment. I, let's hope it never comes, because I'm afraid to say whatever happens, it's not down to us. It's not down to our um, cowardice. The fact is our own governments have decided there will not be direct military intervention by NATO into Ukraine. And the reason they decided it is because they are not ready to do it, physically ready to do it. Their populations are not ready for a nuclear scale confrontation. And, I, I, and to be honest, neither am I. I think it, that's the problem. No, however, there is much more you can do. And those who, the problem with the nuclear scare is it's creating a kind of paralysis, both among politicians and the left of saying, well, we've done a lot, but if we, who wants to risk nuclear war? We, we can't do much more. There is much more things that could be done. Uh, for example, you know, there are there are Western volunteers going to fight. I don't know how useful they will be, but you know, why is there no Western equivalent of Wagner Group? Why is you know why why aren't Western governments equipping really really well equipped anti anti aircraft brigades as on a on a mercenary basis? Because that would have stopped, solved the problem at Yavoriv. So there's more. For the European left, this is a turning point. And it, th there are many positives in it. And I want to say to those comrades in, in, in Ukraine that when you are part of the space we want you to be part of, whatever it's called, you, a wider, more social democratic, just Europe. It may not be the EU originally, and I don't think it will be NATO for, for a decade. When you're part of it, the, the turning point of what that will become is now, because the EU has decided to become self-sufficient in energy, food and defence technology. It's also likely that Sweden and Finland will either become members very rapidly or very close partners to NATO. Their entire, reason, their entire stance is shifting. So we, the left, have an opportunity to make sure that that decarbonisation food and energy security programs are directed by the state, that they benefit the working class. As Yulia says, that there is an end to European fiscal austerity. Forget the ECB and forget Angela Merkel and her Schwarzer Null policy. There must be massive borrowing, taxation of the rich, enforced, enforced um, saving, as in World War II, among the super rich, and if necessary, requisition and nationalization to, to decarbonize the European economy within five years. We have to do that. And we in Britain have to realize that. To NATO, okay, itself is at a turning point. Um, the, the, the only legit, because of the problems and because of the mistakes NATO made, you know, the out of area expansion, Afghanistan, L Libya, and the hubris of, of right wing militarism, which like it's, it comes off of NATO like a smell whenever you're near it. OK, the only thing that is that has worked for them has been to say it's a defensive alliance. This is what Stoltenberg says. It's what Schultz has said. You look in the Spanish parliament where our comrades in Podemos are very worried about sending arms. Some of them didn't want to send arms. You know, what the, 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 the moral leadership was done there by the communist uh, MP Yolanda Diaz, who's the effective leader of Podemos, of, of the, that faction, and said, no, no, you know, we must do it. Um, we're seeing in Finland and Sweden, left-wing female politicians at the forefront of grasping this as an opportunity to democratize NATO, to, to take it away from offensive action and turn it into a primarily defensive and democratized uh, space. And I think we should be, we, uh, uh, one more thing, to any Americans listening, please explain to me, where are the squad? Please explain to me, where is the left of the Democratic Party? Follow their Twitter feeds. It's like this is not happening. It's like they, they, they wished it wasn't happening, so they want to talk about something else. 
It's not enough to be quiet in a time like this. You have to show moral leadership. And I would say to all those people who idolize AOC and Ilan Omar, start idolizing Sana Marin. Start idolizing Joanna, Yolanda Diaz and Magdalena Anderson, the actual European politicians who are standing up way to the left, actually, of any of those American uh, left Democrats, way to the left, and, and defending democracy in Europe, because that's what it's now about. To finish, I just want to say to everybody, Putin can be defeated. His, his aim was to disorganize the West. De attacking Ukraine is just a tactic. As long as we could retain a different kind of unity. I'm not interested in unity with Boris Johnson, political unity with, you know, or praising Ben Wallace, our defense minister. You know, what I am interested in is building a society that Putin can't crack, that the culture warriors of the right can't crack. And I think now is the time when good people on a lot of sides of politics within liberalism, within Welsh and Scottish nationalism, have realized that if we do this right, just as in World War II, there are huge potential benefits. And my only concern is that Ukraine must be included in those benefits. We in the West cannot sell Ukraine out uh, as, as a kind of neutral uh, buffer zone that can be denuded and destroyed by Putin because we ourselves are so terrified and disorganized um, at the present. We, well, we are disorganized. But I want to say that the labor movement here must make, play an important part from the get-go of the, re the re reconstruction of Ukraine, of demanding rights for our comrades in social Europe, rights for our people in so social democratic platform, rights for the trade unions. There will be no Western-oriented Ukraine without a left and a social justice uh, um, space. Uh, in fact, it must expand because the young people of Ukraine will now many two million people will have seen and lived in the West, more than two million. And they will come back saying, well, that's what it was like. We, if we're going to be a Western country, that's, you know, Sweden, <laughs> Sweden, Finland, you know, and, and Barcelona are bloody good places to start from. Uh, and so, so let's have social justice, not simply national self-determination. Thank you for listening to me. Chris? I think we lost our chair. <laughs> Chris, we got it. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, no thank worries. you. I forgot, I forgot to unmute. I bet it was Putin. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I just wanted to make an announcement uh, for the demonstration tomorrow uh, called by Ukraine Solidarity Campaign and Another Europe is Possible. Uh, so it's uh, the, the Home Office at 5 p.m. at the Marsham Street. And uh, it's open the borders, let Ukrainian refugees in now. And uh, it will be supported by a number of MPs, including John and uh, trade unions and organizations. I also wanted to refer uh, you to our uh, uh, financial appeals. Uh, we have a crowdfund uh, on, the, on the website, ukrainesolidaritycampaign.org. And that crowdfund is to raise money for the uh, Federation of Trade Unions of Ukraine, for Sushan Niruk, uh, and for our campaign. Uh, there's also a direct appeals there for uh, Social Niruk and for the Federation of Trade Unions. Uh, so please, please do uh, check check the website. We've uh, there are demonstrations every evening by London Euromaidan at the Trafalgar Square, and every Saturday and Sunday at two o'clock. Please do participate in them. And this Saturday, uh, the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign will be taking a contingent to the uh, Stand Up to Racism demonstration in London. Uh, so I'm going to move to our next speaker. Uh, who's uh, Mick Antonyev, a member of the Welsh Parliament. Uh, he's been a, a long-standing activist and supporter of the Ukrainian cause. Uh, Mick, can I hand over to you, please? OK, well, thanks, guys. I, uh, I'm going to be very, very short indeed, because um, I, I think everybody has said the important things that need to be saying. I'm just going to say one thing, actually, about refugees, because that is a, a real test now of internationalism. Uh, we have two million plus refugees already from Ukraine, uh, and potentially there will be uh, many more, at least doubling that particular number. The uh, position of the UK government is absolutely 
shameful and we should be no surprise that it is shameful because we've seen a nationality and borders bill we know what the what the tory government actually thinks of immigrants uh, and refugees and uh, people who come from uh, from abroad and that's been a consequence of uh, the recent development of uh, far right politics within the uh, tory party the the crux the crux of uh, of my my concern is, is this: uh, Europe is showing that you can have visa free travel, that you can have support for uh, refugees or people who have been forced to to flee from their homes. You can provide support. I've got three cousins, three generations of the same family of cousins who uh, are currently signed up in civil defence. My cousin who's seventy four. He says, uh, I'm not going anywhere, I'm staying here till the end. Um, his son uh, is the same and his grandson is the same. But what they want are for safety, some of the family members to go uh, to be able to uh, stay somewhere where it is safe. So, yes, I've offered my home for that purpose. Many other people are doing something similar. Uh, we've been waiting now two weeks. There may be the possibility now of them being able to apply. We don't know whether it will work, how long it will work, whether it will ever happen, and whether it will happen in a time which actually enables them to get to safety. The alternative is to flee across the border and to get in what is a deteriorating situation uh, of refugees uh, across that border at the moment. And that situation is going to get worse. I think we have to just keep pushing the UK government, uh, who've been dragged kicking and screaming uh, into uh, gradually trying to relax and allow uh, refugees from Ukraine to come. And I make this point to authors, as far as I'm concerned, all refugees are the same wherever they come from, whether they're Ukrainian or from anywhere else. But we have to use this as an opportunity, I think, to expose the, I think the, the inherent racism uh, within the government's, current government's uh, policies. Uh, and we just have to keep pushing. We have to ensure that we do everything we can. I am so proud that Wales and Scotland have both said we will become national sponsors uh, of, of refugees. They can come to our country, give us the responsibility, we will take responsibility, we will coordinate health, education, the sort of medical services that they will need, uh, and so on. My cousin had a uh, one of the cousins who was wanted to come over, uh, I had a place actually on a bus that was delivering uh, uh, body armour, etc. And they were going to take people back, but they decided not to come because they didn't want the uncertainty of coming without a visa. Uh, that bus actually took 21 people through, uh, uh, through Europe, uh, heading towards Ireland, where the Irish government are going to pay for the ferry. They're going to pay for the hotel to put up the families. They're going to keep the families as a family unit. Uh, they're going to uh, recruit uh, Ukrainians to uh, be, to come into the schools to help with the language assimilation and so on. You know, those are the sorts of things we could be doing. And I think we have to just expose, uh, you know, at a time when there is such favourable support for the Ukrainian people, we have to use that as an opportunity to expose the, I think, the racist immigration policy that we have in the UK government. And also then to really support these Ukrainians, because also what they their experience when they're with us will be something they take with them when they go back to Ukraine to rebuild the country, hopefully in the not too distant future. So thanks for that. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Mick. Uh, to, to conclude the meeting, I'm just going to ask two of our guest speakers to make some uh, final points you may have. Uh, first of all, uh, Dennis Pilash. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I saw also questions in the Q&A uh, section. So um, there is no uh, American equivalent of um, the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign, but we have several networks like internationalism from below and another one that is now being set up with many people from France, for instance, uh, connected to the Force International Attack uh, Committee for the Abolition of uh, Illegal Debt and so on. Uh, so I hope that we'll be able to build, build on a, a broader uh, movement on the international left in uh, solidarity with the Ukrainian people. Um, yeah, and uh, probably to uh, do um, a conclusion, um well we can say that um those needs of the uh, ukrainian people in this 
harshest uh, times, times of war. Uh, they can be addressed realistically. And well, it can be really a start for a process of um, uh, rethinking and reshaping the, the global uh, system, global economic and political system. For instance, uh, if we if we insist on um, the rights and the attention to the plight of Ukraine of refugees from Ukraine, that means uh, everyone fleeing, uh, notwithstanding with their citizenship or, and origin, of course, it can be a template that should be applied for all other asylum seekers throughout the world, people who are fleeing conflicts, misery, and so on. If we speak about the debt cancellation, again, if we, uh, if we will be able to uh, uh, accomplish this with Ukraine, it can be a template and uh, a beacon for other countries, especially in the global south, fighting for um, getting out of this uh, vicious circle of uh, debt and austerity politics. And again, it was mentioned that, yeah, we need also to re, uh, ab abandon uh, all, all this um, uh, fiscal austerity and, uh, well, general um, dictate of this uh, uh, international uh, financial institutions that will, will also harm not just Ukraine in its uh, aspirations to uh, rebuild, but uh, is harming people uh, throughout the world and in all the regions of the world as well. But uh, now, at this moment, we need an urgent and uh, maximum concentration on the question of uh, providing enough help for Ukraine and enough help for people of Ukraine. Uh, and providing enough uh, political and economic pressure uh, on the invading um, Russian imperialism in order to uh, achieve a ceasefire and probably a um, withdrawal of Russian troops. So it is done on the ground by the Ukrainian resistance by the Ukrainian people, but it uh, also needs this international solidarity and international aspects that uh, I, I believe will be provided not by uh, corrupt um, bourgeois governments, but by uh, by the people, by, by the, the labor movement, by the uh, working classes throughout the world. So uh, really let's stand for this international solidarity and solidarity of the people, uh, not, not of the governments. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, Ivana, would you like to make some final words to finish? Uh, yes. Um, you know, um, we talk a lot now about, about all of this war, but uh, I know like 100% that a uh, whole world had this uh, experience how to fight in against, against war. So I hope that all of all of us, all of European country, all of war, uh, maybe stop the discussion, but start to do some action. And because uh, all of uh, young people in Ukraine, all of people in Ukraine, and all of people in Europe uh, want to build democracy society, and uh, me and my colleague and my friends want to live in democracy country. Uh, we want to be a part of European Union. And uh, we know that uh, now we have uh, international support. We have, because uh, it's a mistake when we, don't say, when we say that we haven't. And uh, I know that political discussion is a very difficult process. But uh, I want to ask you, uh, talk with your governments, talk with your international colleague that if we have this discussion, this discussion process very long, because when we talk with you now, we have alarming a lot of country in our Ukraine. Now um, they're still bombing Kiev, still bombing Kiev, and now when we have this meeting during two hours, uh, die some people. So uh, if we want to help our country, we have start do some action. It's it's my my 
my my uh, last message for you and thank you one more time for this meeting because i know that you hear us you hear me denise julia uh, vitali and uh, all of our speaker uh, so i hope that uh, this discussion this meeting have some result in future thank you one more time thank you ivana and thank you to all the speakers from ukraine ivana Dennis, Vitaly, Yulia, please stay as safe as you can. Our hearts, our thoughts, our solidarity with you and our solidarity to all the resistance in Ukraine. And thank you to all the delegation. Okay. That's the double. Okay. Good night. Thanks everyone for coming. Good night. Thank you, everyone. The delegation, fantastic to see your faces again. Be safe. Stay safe, everybody. Do our best.